Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, it is uh, five o'clock p.m. and we are here together at a webinar of Medical International. Uh, with Medical International and three partners uh, from South Africa. And I'm still waiting until I see um, the participants calling in now. Uh, I'll just give this another second and then I'm going into explanations how we are going to do it. Oh, what happened? Tendai has left us. Okay, I hope she will be back. Yeah, she is back soon. Okay. Um, we have 65 participants right now, what I see. So I think now it's 71. Okay. Let's give it another. Okay. Maybe we'll reach the 100 and then we can start. Good. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think we can start. Um, Welcome everybody here at this uh, webinar about South Africa health movement of a pandemic. My name is Andreas Wolf. I'm a health um, expert in Medical International. And I'm happy to guide you through all through this uh, next uh, 75 to 90 minutes. That's the plan. Medical International is a German 50-year-old health and human rights organization with strong links to and to support activists and solidarity movement. Maybe we can give more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Andreas, Andreas, just for for a second, I um, apologies for for uh, interrupting you. I see here in the chat that people say that who is not speaking, please remember to p turn your microphones off and that you could speak up a little bit. Um, yeah. Someone wrote the, your, you should be a bit louder if possible. Okay. Thank you. Good. So yeah, please. Um, yeah. Everybody is muted now, but me and I try to keep this headset a bit closer to my mind. Um, so welcome. Welcome again um, to this webinar, South Africa, health movements in times of a pandemic. Um, this is hosted by Medico International, a German 50-year-old health and human rights organization with strong links to and support for health activists and solidarity movements around the world. Our connection with South Africa started in the 1980s while supporting the anti-apartheid struggle and progressive primary healthcare organizations and continues today with connections to self-organized community care workers, NGOs and networks. And I'm happy to have representatives of all these groups here in the chat this afternoon. Um, just a very few technical details. Um, we want to give as much time as possible to our speakers and we but we also want to give you as participants a chance to ask questions during the situa this uh, webinar and we will do this through the chat functions and my colleague Riyad who is with me here in the chat and you can see him um, is going to collect your questions and then uh, after the presentations of the speakers and some interactions between them, um, your questions will also be put into the discussion round. So this is the way how we think this is the interaction with the audience is, uh, is possible and manageable for us. So thank you very much. Um, and I would like to start now 
with a very short two minutes introduction and then I will present my panelists and then we go into the um, presentations themselves. So at the moment, most international day-to-day -day news on the coronavirus pandemic are coming from Europe and the US, which has become the current epicenter of this unprecedented global health crisis after the virus emerged and spread first in China and neighboring countries in East Asia. While here are still the biggest numbers of patients and victims of the virus today, all other regions of the world are increasingly affected too, but get much less media attention. And with this webinar as the first in a series of webinars, we want to look into the challenges of the unfolding coronavirus epidemic and the response to it in South Africa, one of the countries with the biggest social gaps in the world and much less resources in public health systems than in Europe or North Africa. In South Africa, an expensive private healthcare system consumes more than 50% of total health expenses and 70% of doctors work there, but it only cares for 15 to maximum 20% of the population. While the public hospitals, health centers and community health workers care for more than 80% of South Africa's almost 60 million people and are already overburdened as more than 7 million people are on HIV treatment, thousands are dying every year on tuberculosis, and chronic diseases are on the rise in this country. The coronavirus epidemic adds to this huge task, and the response of the government has been strong and heavy. Borders and international traffic have been closed. A curfew has been established 10 years ago, days ago only, and physical distancing has been made mandatory and are enforced by police and security services. However, not all people in South Africa can retreat into home office and comfortable houses and apartments. Poor, cramped housing conditions and the lack of access to sufficient clean water in many informal settlements in the country make protective measures like frequent hand washing and physical distancing almost impossible. We are very happy that we can have three distinguished health activists from different partner organizations of Medico with us this afternoon to give us a first-hand account on the situation right now, what their organizations are doing in this crisis and what they demand from the government and the private healthcare sector to support the people during this crisis and to make their own work and the work of fellow health workers possible. So that's my introduction. And now I would go immediately into presenting our speakers. Uh, we have with us Lydia Cancross. She's a medical doctor working in the public sector in South Africa. And she has been engaged as an activist for the right to health which includes ensuring healthy lives and living and working spaces for all, as well as the right of all people to access quality, equitable healthcare services. She's a member of the People's Health Movement in South Africa. Welcome, Lydia, to you. And then we have Chepo Matoko. He started serving as a community health worker in 2011 and became involved in the struggle of community health workers as a health activist and a writer. And in 2017, he was elected to be a general secretary of Gauteng Community Healthcare Forum, a forum that represents the majority of community healthcare workers in Gauteng, the central province of South Africa with the capital Johannesburg. And last but not least, we have Tendai Mafuma, a legal researcher at Section 27. She is a public interest law organization that focuses on the right to access healthcare services and the right to basic education. She is interested in application of the law and advocacy and advancing human rights. Welcome to all of you. And I would like to start now 
for you to, for the first minutes to have a first round and um, would ask you to please give us a very quick situation report from your respective perspective from the community level and from what you experience how healthcare structures are responding uh, also on the curfew the enforcement situation and how communities and healthcare sectors are responding so who wants to i i suggest we keep the order that i presented you so lydia would you like to start thank you very much um for the invitation and the opportunity to speak and um, greetings to, to everyone um, who's on the, the call. Um, so um, today's day 11 of, of our lockdown in South Africa um, and the this COVID-19 epidemic is, is throwing into stark relief the um, tremendous inequalities that we have in this country. Um, so South Africa has a, a couple of very unfortunate first. So we are the most unequal country in the world. Um, and we also have the largest private sector in relation to total health expenditure in the world, um, bigger than the US proportionally. Um, now we have an epidemic which um, is crossing borders, crossing class lines, crossing racial lines, and is really exposing the failure of um, sort of the post apartheid state in how in delivering um the kind of housing uh, health um economic and educational conditions that we should have had to have a more egalitarian society and a better response to this epidemic so we we know that when when the lockdown started and the issue of physical distancing came up a few weeks ago um, there was a lot of skepticism from many activists. Um, this would prevent us from organizing. We would not be able to get together. We would not be able to apply political pressure in the ways that we know. And so some of the first tasks of, of health activists have been to strengthen the public health message um, that this is an epidemic which requires this kind of work, that we need physical distancing and at the same time we need to build social solidarity. So there's been quite a, an extraordinary realignment of how we engage and how we organize as activists um, in order to respond to this epidemic. Um, in terms of how the lockdown is affecting communities, as you said in your introduction, um, in many communities uh, physical distancing is actually Im impossible. So we have about 13% of the population that lives in informal settlements. Um, we have a shameful um, a situation of water cutoffs and water restrictions in many communities, um, lack of running water for sanitation purposes, um, and uh, informal houses that are, are literally shacks that are situated on top of one another, where there is no outside space to sit outside, where people are living 10, 12 in a room, and it's impossible to expect them to stay indoors in these conditions. Um, so, so this this has posed a, a very particular public health challenge because, as activists, we we understand the deep cynicism of many communities that have looked at these um, recommendations that are really only appropriate in in middle class communities. Um, at the same time, we need to translate that messaging in a way that we do still try as much as possible to reduce the spread of the virus. So as PHMSA, People's Health Movement, we've been trying to play that role, both to mobilize communities and activists to protect the most vulnerable and the poor um, and the disadvantaged in this time, and at the same time to also translate the public health message in a way that um, community leaders, activists, and, and civil society organizations can engage with, respond to, and respect so that we can have a people-led um, lockdown and a people-led approach to this epidemic rather than an army-enforced and police-enforced one, which is unfortunately in the beginning what we've been seeing with this with this lockdown. Yeah. I'll stop there and give more comments later. Yeah, thanks Lydia. Thanks very much. I think it's, it's very good that Chepo Matoko is with us and can add from the, sit the situation of the community care wor healthcare workers uh, in Yeah. 
Um, good afternoon, comrades. Can you hear me? Comrades, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. As you, uh, the president have said, my name is Sebo, and I'm a community health worker from South Africa. COVID-19 have became a huge challenge across the globe. As we speak, there are thousands of people who are suffering from this monster disease. But we can't run away from the fact that our working class society is the most vulnerable and affected group. This is the community that mostly is served by the community health workers on daily basis, who also are at, re at risk of contracting the disease. During this out outbreak in South Africa, it's not easy for the working class to adhere to the precautions, not because they don't want to, but it is caused by the lack of service delivery and the inequality from the government. And, and to the fact that many households cons consist of big families, which is difficult for them to adjust to social distancing and self-isolation. These are the things that we, 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 we can run away from as the working class. And also that um, the people are supposed to help the community health workers who every day are on the field trying to help the, the community when it comes to health. They are not being supported by the government. These are the people who are supposed to 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 be doing tracing of our uh, tracing of COVID uh, nineteen contacts, educating the community of all the precautions, and also conducting a screening as the president has or um, ordered. But it's not simple when it comes to community health workers since they are not being provided with protective gears. Um, I will stop there. Thank you for now. Thank you, thank you, Chepo. Um, and I just explained to, to the participants, we would have loved also to see all of you speaking, but the internet connection that is right now makes it not possible to using also video, so we are stick with uh, the audio channels. Thank you very much. Um, so let's go to our third speaker, Tendai. Mafuma, she has a, a different picture. This is obviously not her picture. Uh, we are sorry we couldn't mm -hmm. solve this technical little problem. So, <laughs> with my picture, but her own voice. Thank you, Tendai. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Andreas. I hope everyone can hear me. And thank you so much for joining this webinar. Um, I think my colleagues, Lydia and Sepo, have really summed up what the picture is looking like in South Africa at the moment. Um, I think one of the things that may not have come up really is just the efforts that civil society organizations have been putting to try and disseminate accurate information to the communities. There's been a lot of um, fake news um, on social media, trying to, you know, you know um, on d different aspects, um, issues about vaccinating and tracing. So that's been a very key area that social, um, that civil society organizations have been trying to work towards to make sure that, um, you know, we're not adding to the panic. Uh, and we're dealing with, with fake news and misinformation around COVID. Um, COVID. And I think for us, um, from Section 27 perspective, is really we've just been trying to look at the regulations that have been put in place, so the new temporary pieces of law that have been put in place to try and curb the spread of the virus, to see whether... Um, you know, the government has taken enough measures to mitigate um, violation of rights, 
So we are looking at um, working with other partners, making sure that healthcare providers are provided with the necessary protective equipment like what Sepo and Lydia have alluded to. Um, and also the other thing that we've been trying to work on is to make sure that the private sector comes to the party and also helps in dealing with this with this pandemic that is ravishing the entire world at the moment. So that has been a key thing that we're trying to intervene on as well as Section 27. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no, this this is this is very helpful. I think this is the first round. Um, I, can I ask my colleague Riyad if you have already some questions from the audience, or shall we continue for a second one, which maybe focuses again a little more on um, also your responses from the different from the different actors that 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 you present mm -hmm. in this situation. And then we can come up to demands that you have more precisely also as uh, Tendai already started working to it. Well, do, you, do you want two questions that were asked from the audience or do you want to proceed? Um, no, let's, I have, yeah. yeah. If, if you say this is, it's better to proceed then we do a second round, I think. That gives us a bit more background, yeah? Okay, Lydia, do you want? No, Lydia has disappeared for the moment. Um, so, Chepo, would you would you like to 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 make a, make again a bit of a, a, some clear demands that you, as the the forum of community healthcare workers, have put in this situation out? Okay. Um, like I'm afraid that if COVID-19 uh, begins to spread heavily in the township, the working class is not only going to die of the disease, but also of hunger. Mm -hmm. At, because most, most of the most of the people, they will be uh, quarantined and we are speaking of like, we will be facing another challenge that uh, maybe even the quarantine side, they will be full because it seems like the department and the government is not prepared to deal with the outcome of the disease. Children will be left vulnerable without anybody taking care of them. Community health, work, community health workers already began to spread awareness to the community, but we saw as the forum that there is there is uh, a need to to protect the work, the, the working class uh, society. Nothing that beat an organized society. If the government is failing, then it is up to us in unity to share the little that we have to organize food parcels for those who can put bread on the table because of this disease and also to identify places we can use as isolation or quarantine site within the community. For example, we can use community halls, churches, schools, even stadium. We just need to force the government to supply with the basic needs. So as Houghton Community Health Care Forum, we demand that our, our government recognize the community health workers. Sorry? Okay, sorry about that. I think there was a sound in the background. Sure, sure. Yeah, we heard. No, as Houghton, yeah. Good. Okay. Okay, thanks, Echo. Okay, as Houghton. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, no, that's that's very helpful. Um, let's see. Tendai is with us. Tendai, what you want to want to yes, say? Um, maybe, maybe a bit more. What you what you refer to? How the private sector can be like pushed to come to the table that you wanted to. Okay. 
thanks, thanks, Andreas. So I'll start with um, that question that you just pointedly asked about how the private sector can be pushed. Yeah. And I think for us, the first thing is that the different um, regulations that have been passed by the government actually allows for private and public sector to collaborate um, and make sure that they can coordinate their efforts. So I think for us, that's a really big, um, it's a it's a big improvement and we're quite excited to see how that's going to play out because like you said in the beginning, the private sector has quite a lot of resources and it only services about 16 to 20 percent of the of the population so there really is a need for a collaboration between private and public to make sure that um you know people have better increased access to to services um and we can ramp up our screening and testing and curb the spread of this virus so that's the first thing and we are pushing for that pushing for also transparency in the agreements that are going to take place because it's quite important that in this time of you know uncertainty and um it's very unprecedented times um it's important for there to be accountability and transparency so that resources are efficiently used and everyone who needs services is able to access them so that's one of the key things that we've been pushing for to make sure that when these agreements are are put in place people actually do benefit from them and then there's no corruption yeah um and and then the other thing that i would also just want to respond to that that sepo raised um is really about the wider impacts of covid and the the regulations that we've put in place um so a lot of them put restrictions on economic activity. So as a result, a lot of people have lost their livelihoods. So there's a real concern that a lot of people are going to be going hungry. Um, and so just trying to make sure that the state is also um, directing its efforts at making sure that people still receive food and people still receive the medicines that they need for other illnesses because COVID is not existing in, an, in a vacuum, right? There's still other problems out there in the healthcare system. Yeah. So we've also been trying to keep a full, yeah. Um, and then obviously the big thing that Lydia and 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 Sepo have also mentioned is is the importance of making sure that our healthcare providers who are on the front lines are protected um, from you know getting infected themselves. Um, so that is also a big a big part of our focus. Mm -hmm. And with 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 making sure that there's also continued service of. Um, you know, there's continuity of, of service in terms of healthcare services. People should still be able to go into facilities and receive treatment and, and attention for non-COVID related issues. Yeah. Um, everything can't grant to a hold so that we deal with COVID and then go back to other issues. Good. Okay, thanks Tendai. Um, I'm afraid we have lost Lydia for the moment. Um, I'm trying to maybe maybe we can then continue with uh, Riyad and ask him to point out a few of the questions that our audience has put in the chat room and then we see how we continue from there and then I try to see if Lydia can rejoin us. <clears throat> uh, okay, you want to go three questions at a time or I give you all five or six questions? Five questions that have come up so far. Six questions. Um, let's let's start with three questions, and if they are directed to one of the speakers, then also no, no people weren't specific about that. So um, Tara and Demere, she's asking, or he's asking, how are they mobilizing poor communities during this time? This is the first question. Um, then uh, Berenice Meintjes is interested in the question. How do we best use this crisis as an opportunity for greater equality in South Africa and in laying the foundations for the national health insurance? Yeah. And then there's uh, Josette Cole who asked, since there is an interconnection between the formal and informal set settlements, what is the overall health strategy here? Yeah, okay. Um, so how we, who wants to... What anybody of you wants to wants to answer the questions? Um, um, I think on the on the national health 
Okay. Insurance, I think it might be Tendai and and maybe also the mobilization yes. of poorer communities. What Chepo, would you want to comment on this? Okay. Okay, I will comment on that. Good. Thank you. Okay. Can I go first? Yeah, go first. Mm. Okay, community as community of yeah. Okay, as community of workers, we work on the ground. We work uh, within these uh, poor communities in each and every day, even during um, this time. So we 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 took it uh, as an opportunity to educate our people, to organize our people, so that they may know what uh, um, this COVID, the, the outcomes of uh, this disease and what uh, the government is able to do and what the government is not uh, unable to do and what we, we, we can do as the community. Yeah, yeah. I think I will okay. end there. Mm -hmm. um, and before I go into the NHI question, if I can just also add to the question about mobilizing poor communities. Sure. I think it's been it's been quite it's been quite important um, for a lot of the organizations to to try and tackle the issue of um, fake news, especially in relation to you know homemade cures that people can use. Um, and I think I think that's been a very important aspect, considering that we had similar challenges in the beginning of the fight against HIV. Um, so, so just trying to make sure that you're putting out the right information, but also trying to make sure that the the measures that we are putting in place somehow what are able, you know. Are able to uh, they're implementable. So, for example, in your in your introduction, and yes, you mentioned the fact that a lot of people don't have access to water, and I think um, Lydia may have mentioned this. Yet, one of the issues that one of the preventative measures that we are being told is to wash your hands and sanitize. So, it's been quite important to mobilize communities around fighting for other basic human rights that they haven't had access to um, prior to COVID. So I think going forward after the lockdown that we're in and also, you know, when, when the pandemic is somehow under control, I think it will see quite a big difference um, in terms of our advocacy for human rights in general because of, of some of the impacts that COVID has had um, just widely. Um, and then just speaking to the NHI for Bernice's question. So for those of you who are not familiar, the National Health Insurance is one is um, a measure that the government is considering putting in place, which is basically going to be a health financing system. And the purpose of that is to bring together the private and the public health system so that you improve access and you don't have this big divide that we have now that is quite unequal. And, and so this proposal makes quite a, a lot of changes. For instance, it anticipates that private and public will work together. So one of the things that have actually been put to test by COVID is whether private and public can work together and how they can do that. Um, and also, it's also just brought to, to, it's highlighted how unprepared our health system was for something such as this and the importance of strengthening the health systems. And this goes back to issues such as just making sure that we have the right infrastructure, making sure that we have um, the right number of healthcare providers. So there's, I think um, COVID has, for you know, I, I don't know how to say it, but it has come at a very opportune time for us to test our healthcare system to see whether it is ready for the implementation of this NHI and how it's going to work um, as a health financing system. Okay. Yeah. Can Can I directly um, add yeah. two two sub questions because um, sure. I'm seeing other questions that I haven't shared with you yet. Sure. Um, because there is a great interest, I think, also in. Um, what what kind of concrete lessons health activists can draw on from uh, from from HIV and their experience in 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 fighting the the HIV virus in 
in previous years or decades and then someone else has exactly raised the question or the, the problem that the private sector uh, with with an excess uh, capacity um, versus the the public sector that is sure to be overwhelmed when if the virus spreads through communities and and there are severe COVID-19 cases um, the private sector is willing to assist, but he's not really willing to join a national health service. So um, does the panel not think we should use the language of social solidarity and um, promote a single national health service in this regard? These were two more questions. Okay. Can, can I also add uh, another? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's continue with the with this uh, question. Ah, and we have uh, Lydia from Pe People's Health Movement South Africa again with us. Hi, can you hear Hi. me? Hi, great, great that you come back. Um, did you hear the questions? Um, so, I've just heard the last one on social solidarity. Can you hear me? Yeah, maybe, okay. maybe this is a good entry point for you to join us again. Yes, yeah, sorry that I, I've missed a, a few minutes of, of the discussion. Yeah. So yeah, the the issue of uh, uh, having two health systems and the um, the cruel absurdity and irrationality of of um, having a a corporatized um, for profit health system, I think, is really um, particularly um, visible and obvious to all of us at this time. Mm -hmm. And. We would like to see that if something at least can come out of the tragedy of this epidemic, that we have a new way of looking at how we deliver health services to people, that we do not request from the private sector that they assist the public sector, but that we rather say this is an epidemic that is affecting everybody and we need a one health system response to this epidemic. Um, and what's critical for us right now is that there should be transparency about the agreements that are being made between the public and the private sector. Mm. We know that some of those discussions are happening in terms of how resources are going to be shared. Um, and it's absolutely critical that we do not have profiteering out of this disaster. Um, so the call for social solidarity has to be front and center in what we do, and particularly a call for solidarity between health workers. Um, health workers in both sectors are affected um, negatively by uh, the crisis in our health system. So in the public sector, we have a crisis of maladministration, um, corruption, um, and poor use of resources, as well as underfunding. And in the private sector, we have a crisis of um, profiteering, control by big corporates, um, health workers being held to ransom by medical insurance schemes. And what we want to do is call for health workers across both sectors to say it's time for us to build a one health system for all people based on need, not profit. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe this is a good moment for Chepo to respond on this also, because we also have a question here on how the community health workers can interact with uh, trade unions that organize a bit traditionally the traditional uh, employed uh, nurses and doctors. Would you, Chepo, would, would that be something you want to comment on? Um, okay, in terms of um, community health workers um, engaging with other trade uh, unions when it comes to the issue of community health workers, I think... Um, Everyone who's uh, everyone who's organizing the working class is uh, welcome to do so, as long they have uh, a purpose or they have uh, a, a a goal or, 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 or of seeing the the community health workers helping in the in the health sector because. In the past years, community health workers have uh, played a crucial role when it's come to the health system in the community. And we can't run away from the fact that we haven't seen um, we haven't seen uh, the 
we haven't seen um, these unions, uh, the trade unions, coming to organize community health workers until other social movement they saw a need that there is a need to organize community health workers. There is a need for community health workers to stand for themselves. But if like the trade unions they are willing to enter into this to enter into into this situation and help community health workers, then they are welcome to do so. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, J Paul. Um Tendai, do you want to Add to the questions. Um, no, thanks, Andreas. I think I'm covered by by Lydia and Sepo. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what what other what other questions are in the audience. Riyad, could you? Yeah, I think that that question by Baba I about not NOPS or the National Union of I'm I'm, I'm not sure with the what what the acronym stands for. Mm -hmm. um, that has issued a statement condemning the non-provision of PPEs to community health workers and demanding urgent action by government. Uh, there was a question how the Community Health Forum is collaborating with trade unions. I'm not sure if this now has been um, sufficiently answered. And um, the, the same person is also interested in um, getting an insight on the, on the uh, C19 People's Coalition and there was a comment on Tendai's statement about people having lost uh, or losing their livelihoods. Um, can't we put forward demands to the government against this, as was done in other countries, um, also in Germany, by the way? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Riyad. Um, who wants to... Uh, Andres, I'll, I'll maybe make a comment there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then and then hand over to Tendai afterwards. So the um, perhaps to start with the peop, uh, the C19 People's Coalition. I, I know that um, just before I left the call, um, I'm not sure if it was Tendai that was about to speak to that. But the the C19 People's Coalition is a grassroots um, spontaneous coalition that um, has grown over the past few weeks into a network of about. 200 different organizations um, and in these organizations in, in this network we have um, a range of organizations from trade unions to social movements like the people's health movement um, health individual health, health activists um, people working um, on food security around water um, sanitation housing so it's a kind of cross-cutting across all the main um, issues and there's a call to action, which is a 10-point call to action, is addressing um, things like income security, um, food and water security. Um, and, and one of those is, is around the health and health systems issues specifically. So in terms of collaboration with trade unions, there is connection within that forum. Um, we know that um, Nehawu, the other major health union in the country, is taking the states to court at the moment around PPE, um, personal protective equipment, and the lack of availability of PPE for community health workers, but actually health workers across the formal sector as well. So that is going to be a massive issue that, that we will mobilize around. And of course, the PPE issue is a global crisis. Um, and I think mm -hmm. as progressive activists, we need to look at where the supply chain issues and what is the political economy around what's happening with PPE and why health workers can't actually access the, the necessary equipment that they need. So there, there is that community mobilization and there is that connection with trade unions. Um, I think that the connection with the trade union movement should be strengthened um, and it's something that we need to continue to work on, but there is the collaboration that has already started. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Okay. Um, Tendai? Yes, I'll just pick off where, where Lydia left it. And I think um she's I think there is definitely an there's definitely an issue of loss of livelihoods because of the restrictions in movement and economic um activity. And you know, at this stage we're just trying to explore the different in, um, interventions that can come into play. So for example, where we we are seeing that there's been an impact on access to food. 
um, what are the various interventions that can be that can be put in place there. So I think there's different um, sort of efforts from various um, civil society organizations just trying to see how we can lessen the burden of COVID on the most vulnerable and the marginalized who have also um, whose livelihoods have also been impacted. So various calls are being made about um, you, like what Lydia was saying, you know, security of income. Um, making sure that the departments provide food for children and and those sort of interventions. Hmm. Okay, I see. Good. Um, I I think um, Riyadh, would you have some more questions from the audience? In abundance, there's always more. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'll try to maybe group these two together. There are um, Melanie Muller and Irene Vance, who are both um, interested kind of not only in informal settlements, but also in generally in poorer communities. So one of them asks, um, can you tell us more about the challenges in rural and in urban communities and how do the provinces react to the challenges do they follow a one-size-fits-all approach or are different and specific approaches visible to support poorer communities in their respective regions? That's Melanie Muller and Irene is interested specifically um, in the face of, uh, of uh, the coronavirus. What about water and sanitation and better housing conditions, which has been on the pri which have been priorities for, for decades and is is there anything being done in that um, emergency situation to help people protect themselves? Okay, who's going to to answer this? Any? Um, who wants? Who want to go? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Paul. Go. I will go first. Okay. No. I think there is a huge uh, difference when he's coming to the urban cities and um, the rural places. It's how it is in South Africa. Like there is a big, a huge um, inequality that is taking place uh, in South Africa. Even today, like I was trying to just check uh, the facilities, the health facilities that will be conducting um the COVID nineteen testing. Most of the places in the rural areas and the like they have uh, chosen maybe one or two places which are are far from other people. Mm -hmm. So it means like uh the community won't be able to reach out those facilities when they want to test the COVID-19. Um, so there is a big inequality when it's come, yeah. a big inequality in South Africa. Sure. No. Okay. Nice. Anybody? Maybe, maybe hmm? just to add to that, I think that the, the response has been patchy. So initially it was very much a one-size-fits-all plan we have seen some provinces focus on the emergency delivery of water to communities. Um, there has largely been a cessation of the cutting off of water supplies, but not everywhere. Um, and, and the disjunction between national government and municipalities has become clear where um, the national policy is to get water out, uh, but some municipalities have still been cutting off water supplies and there has been an urgent call to, for that to stop coming from the state itself. Um, and then there's, there is a plan to de-densify some communities, which we find quite worrying and problematic um, because we're not fully understanding how that would be implemented. Um, and a number of, of areas have been identified that, that would need to be de-densified. Um, and of course, coming into a society which has suffered um, from evictions and, and forcible removals, both under apartheid and actually under the current government. It's an extremely um, sensitive issue and, and problematic thing to consider. So those are some of the 
sort of strategies that the government has come up with to address our our different context. Um, but actually, I think the most robust and, and inspiring work has come from from a range of, of um, individuals and civil society members. So there are community groups that have set up um, action networks where um, suburban areas are supporting um, more high density um, urban township areas with uh, food, um, hand sanitizer, um, with uh, assisting with interesting water devices for hand washing. And those are, are very local and, and um, local specific initiatives that have actually come from the bottom up. And we're seeing some solidarity across the class lines, which is, of course, um, very positive. So really a patchy attempt from the state and, and, and quite a significant mobilization from people on the ground. Thank you. Um, more, maybe maybe one one point I've seen in the in the the chat is also that 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 continues in this field because I what you said that um, that there has been equal access also to to um, to services. What I understood from the situation in South Africa, there is a bit of uh, the question of discrimination, people on the move, on migrants, and also uh, refugees that have already um, difficulties in accessing um, health services and, and other social services in South Africa. Do you see this as something uh, escalating, or is this rather the crisis, a moment where like these solidarity structures, as uh, Lydia just explained, are taking also more hold in the society. Any? <laughs> yep. No. Okay. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe we continue. Mm -hmm. Well, let's mm -hmm. let's keep it like this. Somebody wants to speak up. Uh, Ria. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I think you're referring to our, our issues around xenophobia and and the violence that we've seen in South Africa. Yeah. I don't think we know. I think it's difficult to say which way this will go. Yeah. Um. You know, we are in. Uh, we are a society really afflicted by violence on many levels. There's the, um, the sort of systemic violence of of capitalism and the the violence of of the what's left of from apartheid. There's um, gender-based violence and then there is violence against the other which mm. we see and I think like in any massive crisis um, we could find a way towards a, a greater solidarity but I think it is also realistic to be aware that there may be explosions of of these frustrations and, and forms of violence in communities that are now locked down um, and are forced to stay in very close proximity to one another um, we know that there's also um, stigmatization of people affected by COVID-19 and there's a lot of our history of HIV and AIDS that is coming up as well. So I, I'm not sure that anyone knows the answer to that, but I think it's a very important question. Mm. Thanks. Um, more on this from your, from others? Um, Riyadh, can you give us more input from yeah. the audience? There was this question about um, protective, personal protective equipment oh. for, for health workers, community health workers and, and medical staff. And uh, our colleague Ushi is asking, hasn't there been any statement from the government about protective gear for health workers? And something that might be related to that is the question about um, by Nkululeko Konko, would centralized procurement and distribution based on need assist in addressing some of these issue, issues around resources? Who could say something about this? Um, okay, I think... Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, I think uh, when it's come to issues, when it's come to the PPEs, um, okay, the government, when they speak or when they are making statements, they will say that we have provided a certain PPEs to such a group, but the reality is they do not uh, reach the the facilities sometimes we 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 don't know maybe it's because of the inequalities that is taking place in within uh even the the workplace they will prefer to 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 make sure that uh the nurses and the sisters are protected are protected but when it comes to community health workers who are going to the field each and every day they will be not protected or they will not be given a uh, protective gear to protect themselves to the point whereby, like we know in a facility, in a facility in each and every room, there is a, a, a hand sanitizer. But when it comes to, it's hard like to provide a, a sanitizer to community health workers who go to the field each and every day. Like, some of the facilities, community health workers, they don't have gloves, they don't have, even have masks, but those people are expected to go to the field each and every day. They are expected to go to conduct uh, the screenings, they are, go, they are expected to go to give up the health education when it comes to COVID-19. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, if I can just, if I can also just add, Andreas, I think the no. issue with PPE, I think the issue with PPE is a, a global concern at the stage. Um, so, you know, it's it's something that is really high on our agenda to make sure that the adequate, the appropriate PPE is provided to um, yeah. the various groups of of of, of healthcare providers. Um, so, so the, there is some efforts. I, I understand that there is a solidarity fund that has been established, and they're going to try and use that to pro procure PPE um, for healthcare providers. And I think it's it's quite key for us for for the C19 group. What we've said is that you know the appropriate PPE should be provided for the different health healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not calling for one standard set of PPE for everyone. Yeah. But yeah. That's that's what I can add. Okay, thank you. There, there are some more comments from the audience on this, and and one interesting thing I just have seen, Riyad, if I might uh, take your take your work, um, is that that some people is asking about how much you see or you can confirm that there might be also a ban on exports of PPEs from Europe to South Africa because uh, there is the question if there is enough local production, or if this might also add to a, a dynamic of, of a global solidarity versus global uh, non-solidarity when it comes to the PPE. And then, of course, also in the future uh, of a possible vaccine or medications, um, which, which also... I remember was part of the debates around HIV AIDS, of course. Do you see this already taking up in in your country, these discussions or realities? Thanks, Andreas. Oops, Maybe I'll just... Um... Sorry, che who is, who is uh, Chepo? Can you mute your, tel your mic if you are not speaking? Because it seems, uh, yeah, it seems it's a bit noisy behind you. Thank you. Um, yeah, these these concerns around um, the global political and economic issues around PPE are coming up um, in our discussions. Um, we know that a few weeks ago, South Africa was also an exporter of some PPE, and and we know that um, there was a, a scramble to try to to see what we have and to make sure that a lot of what we have is not exported. And of course. What this means as a world is how how do we have solidarity across the globe and not um, 
you know, silo into nationalism and protecting the people within our borders. Um, and um, for that, we really need to understand the supply chain and, and where things are being produced and which factories and companies can be refitted to produce PPE rather than to produce arms and um, luxury items. Um, so I think in South Africa, our, our call is, first of all, we must demand um, PPE at the standard recommended by the WHO in mm -hmm. all our facilities and for all health workers. We know that um, there have been some attempts to have different kinds of guidelines to protect against the scarcity of PPE, but we think that we must start with what is best practice and then we need to look at the supply chain in order to make that possible. The issue with community health workers is, uh, to quote one of my comrades, it's a crisis on a crisis. So community health workers have never really been formally given the appropriate recognition within the health system. And so now that they are expected to be frontline workers in this epidemic, the issue is that there is no um, clear line of supply in terms of gloves and other equipment um, that community health workers have needed means that it's very difficult to get PPE out to community health workers now. So the Solidarity Fund has been set up, but they're scrambling for how to find the correct groups to get the correct equipment out to the correct people. Um, so this is really an opportunity for us to demand that community health workers are brought into the formal health system, um, are adequately remunerated, not treated as casual workers, and are given the appropriate PPE as health workers for the settings in which they are working where actually a 1.5 to 2 meter distance from people in a home is often not possible. So a mask is necessary and we need to see the WHO guidelines in the context in, of the communities that, that they are working in. Um, so that's the first thing, we need the WHO guidelines to be adhered to. And the second thing is that we should use the powers of, of the Disaster Act to, um, uh, to surface where the production issues are and where the bottlenecks are and what the trade agreements might be around this issue so that we can campaign in a, in a radical way for a truly equitable and solidarity approach to PPE, both in our country and beyond the borders. Mm. I see. Um, Chepo, what you or who else want to comment on this? Well, if, if there's no if there's no uh, more comments on on PPEs and yeah. like solidarity, there there still are questions actually about um, about stigmatization and uh, pressures on refugees and the homeless, and there are questions about really concrete, really really concrete questions that I'm getting to in a moment. So. Um, a colleague from India, or at least uh, is writing about um, India, Manish Gupta, um, he reports uh, about suicide, um, suicides in government centers where people have been forced to go into quarantine. And he's interested um, if this has also been reported from, from other regions. And there was the question about stigmatization of people. Um, Peter Wiesner had asked about seasonal migrant workers. You brought it up, Andreas, and um, now this was added by by uh, Judith, who's referring to refugees and um, homeless people, and she's wondering if, say, boarding houses of of uh, schools and universities, um, if there's pressure on these to open up to take in people. Also, because most boarding schools um, will have sick bays as she, as she says, is there any interest or pressure to access these resources for people in need? That's what she would like to know. Who can answer on this? Um, I think Lydia said something on it already. That's right. Do you want to go? Uh, sure. So um, first, in, in terms of... of um, of homeless people, we we do know that um, at least within certain provinces, um, uh, accommodation has been provided uh, during this time. The quality of that accommodation and what is happening within the facilities are, are difficult to know. But from what we have have seen, we haven't heard reports that they are not adequate. The issue of, of quarantine, isolation, and stigmatization is massive. Um, 
And what we have been calling for is the people's health movement is for us to 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 read conceptualize these as health sanctuaries and that we need to have a strong public message in that we are we are taking um, precautions to separate people from families in order to protect their families and their loved ones and in order to take care of people better because we know isolation self isolation cannot happen in overcrowded communities the the state is looking at um, things like universities and schools and other locations to to set up these um, quarantine or health sanctuary facilities um, we are still really at the beginning end of our mass testing our mass screening and testing so we haven't really had the the real test of whether these facilities will be well accepted and whether they will be well provisioned and whether they will be of sufficient quality and dignity for people to feel safe and protected within them um, mm -hmm. but it is something that there is pressure from from below and there is also planning coming from above. One of our biggest challenges as the People's Coalition is that um, it's been very difficult for us to get a voice within the decision-making structures within the government. They are hoping to treat civil society mainly as um, deliverers of, of service um, and not really partners in, in, the, in the conceptualization of programs. So the information we get is often patchy um, but we know from uh, queries that have been made in communities for particular co accommodation spaces that this is beginning to happen. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Who else? Um, uh, maybe Chepo, you want to comment on the on this this problem that that uh, Lydia was explaining. That, that, that community care workers are not formally recognized in the system and maybe or do you see that this can be used now as an opportunity to really push for this recognition as I know that the forum and this uh, network of community care workers has uh, put a great deal of effort in it over the last years to do this. If you want, yeah. Um, I think we as community health workers, like we we have been here for 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 ages now. We've been on the front line when it comes to fighting HIV and AIDS, TB, and other chronic diseases and helping the community when it comes to 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 the issue of of health like we we are the link between the health facility or the health system and the community so there is a need of our, our, our government to formalize community health workers as a, a formal structure of the system or as a, the public servants or, or of the state. It's not because of uh, um, what currently is happening in the world or e, e, e in the country, but there is a need of community health workers because we, 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 we can fight the COVID-19 yeah. together, but it, that, it doesn't mean that there won't be uh, other challenges that we, 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 we need to tackle or we, we we not we, we we are we are going to to face. So there is a need of community health workers. This is not just a program for six months, then it'll be over. But it is a lifetime. It is a job that uh, someone can wake up in the morning and say, "I'm going to work. I'm going to report to work and provide for his family at the same time." Yeah. Oh. So there is a great need of. Uh, yeah in sourcing community health workers in the system. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, I've seen, I've seen another, Riyad, you want to? I'm, I'm, we, are, we are close to our plans of being finishing, but maybe last, last comments from the audience and then I also would like to give all of you a last round of final 
um, final demands, final messages, and maybe also an, an, a point on the global, uh, the global perspective, if you want to add. I think I, yeah, I'd like to share, um, th there are very, very concrete questions um, that, as I said earlier, um, so Irene goes back to the question of that C19 uh, People's Coalition or coalition, and she really explicitly repeats this question is really about mechanisms of mobilization. Um, namely, um, how has the C19 coalition been able to build connectivity between organizations in a short time, given that meetings, I mean, real life meetings are prohibited, in particular, the role of tech, do grassroots organizations have access to the to the necessary technology? Because typically mobilization, as she points out, in communities are uh, community meetings and house to house visits. That's the one question about concrete mechanisms of mobilization. And the other one um, is um, about um, how to protect actually workers from more densely populated areas who may have to go to work in, um, she, she, she picks the example of, of Cape Town, where she sees a higher prevalence of COVID-19 in the southern suburbs. So she's, she's looking for a strategy to protect these more densely populated areas where the workers come from to work in, um, in areas that are more affected by the virus and how to prevent a spread from the maybe less populated but better off neighborhoods to poorer neighborhoods where the, where the actual people who, who do the work, where they come from and it seems still come from and are coming from even though there might be a restriction on their uh, mobility in their, in their personal life. Okay. Um, and then I have one question about, and that's maybe then the last one, how is the availability of testing materials as a base of isolation decisions? Okay, this is a very concrete public health strategy question. Um, who wants to go for one of the questions? On the C19, how you organize these kind of people, people coalitions in times of COVID-19? and who has access and who has not. I think all of you could say something. Strategies for populated areas, how to protect people themselves. Just, Lydia. I'll just comment on, on the C19 People's Coalition. It's a, yeah. a, a massive problem um, organizing yeah. uh, when, we are, when we are used to meeting and, and going door to door. Um, but South Africa has um, a very high um, penetration of uh, mobile phones. So most people actually do have mobile phones. The problem is, is the cost of data um, and of airtime. So most of the uh, coalition meetings are done um, through, meeting, so through online meeting platforms such as Zoom um, or GoToMeeting. Um, and we share data with comrades who do not have data to log in. Um, uh, and um, we've also organized the coalition into clusters of, of activity. So, so you can in some places have hybrid where two or three people may be able to come together and, and adhere to physical distancing and then log on to a call with a, with a bigger group of people. Um, um, the clustering has also meant that we are able to be more focused on on the ground work. So um, there are WhatsApp groups around around food or around water or around specific needs in in particular neighbourhoods. But really, we have been using online platforms that other comrades can comment if if they want if they if they have more information on this. But we have been using that. Um, the the one concern is the degree of um, internet coverage in some areas is patchy, um, but we have actually managed to do quite a lot of mobilization through through the online um, platforms and with phones. Uh, just briefly on the southern suburbs versus um, townships, absolutely a key point. So yes, the, the COVID-19 has come in through travelers really into South Africa, 
Um, and that has been a, up till now, mainly middle class phenomenon, but obviously it's shifting rapidly. And the biggest shift between suburbs and townships is around domestic work. Um, and to a large extent, um, domestic workers are no longer coming into work. They're not considered essential workers, which is, uh, which is excellent because that would have been um, a very, very problematic mechanism of spread um, from, from suburban areas to, to township areas. A key issue, though, is public transportation, which continues. People continue to use taxis, and there's been a lot of um, policy shifts and debates around how to make public transport safer, how to decrease the crowding in public transportation, and, and that brings up the issues of masks and so on as well. Mm -hmm. I'll leave my comment there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lydia. More on this from one of you. Um, or else, I think the other one, the last one, was a rather technical question on oh. materials. Oh, yeah, Tendai. Sorry, sorry, and no. if I can just no. add a bit sure. to right. to what Lydia talked about in terms of um of for of the of the meetings taking place, I think one of the there's also been like some innovative um sort of platforms that were already in place that we're trying to use to communicate with groups that are outside you know like wider groups so for example with with community health care workers there's a platform that had been um developed together with phm called bavuse which doesn't need people to have smartphones so we're able to send um information to community health care workers about the various initiatives that are taking place and also just keeping them updated. So I think there's been yeah. quite some innovative um, ideas in terms of um, convening these meetings and making sure that the work continues. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Tenda. And yeah. Well, uh, well, if there's if there's a minute left, there's one more question, right? Okay. The, pers the person writes, I would be interested to get some more insights into the idea and stra or strategy of a people's led lockdown and how it's going to be realized, if at all. Anyone? Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, <you> <laughs> You want to? What um, is this? A people's led lockdown. So, yeah. Uh, sure, you know. Um, speak to that. Yeah. Uh, Lydia? Lydia? If Lydia can speak to that. Yeah. Uh, so, and, Andrea, so, so myself and, and Kelly from the coalition um, authored an article called um, We Need a People's Led, Not Army Enforced Lockdown. And, and we really wrote that in response to those first few days of images of, of mm -hmm. police beating up people. And we've had a number of deaths, actually, um, from, from enforcement of the lockdown. And, and what we were trying to say is that a lockdown can really, a, a public health um, initiative, like a lockdown to protect everybody, can only work with the, where the vast majority of people are um, committed, um, invested in, and in agreement with the principles mm. of the lockdown. So it needs a massive public education campaign, but also needs recognition of the very rich history of grassroots mobilization in this country. And we were calling on the state to partner with um, respected um, leaders in communities, people that are, um, are, that are, are trusted, um, and that we, we develop a, a, a consensus around what we should be doing to protect mm. everybody in this time rather than having army boots and guns on the street to make it happen. Um, so the people's, um, the C19 People's Coalition is really working hard on, on trying to make that a reality, that, that we do this from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks. That's, that's really inspiring. Can, can, and, uh, Lydia, because someone asks concretely um, uh, where the article is to be found, if, or if there is... If you can say who, who wrote it, maybe, so that people can find it. Sure, it's, it's in the Daily Maverick. Um, and um, myself, Lydia Kencross, and Kelly Gillespie were the authors. Okay, thanks. Up 
Yes, thank you. I think we, we are coming close to the end of the seminar. So I would like to give all of you another round of final words and maybe also some words on the global community, what you feel is, um, is important in these times and also what we might learn from South Africa in our particular countries. Who wants to go? Who wants to go? Tendai first? Tendai? Sure. Um, I, I, yes. Sure, I can, I can go first. Um, okay. I think, like, like I said at the beginning, that, you know, we, one of the things that we're really thinking about and keeping in mind, even in this um, C19 group, is beyond... Um, the lockdown beyond this pandemic that we're experiencing now, and also, you know, just how do we strengthen our health systems? So I think I think there's going to be um, quite a big shift when we come out of this, and just in terms of how we work and how we we get that done, and you know, the different coalitions that have been formed and the different areas of work and how they interact with each other. So it's quite a it's going to be interesting to work post um, post the COVID. COVID pandemic, um, yeah. Good, okay. Who else? Chepo, maybe? You haven't spent some time. Mm, okay. Last words, which is? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think nothing will beat, uh, I still repeat, nothing will beat uh, organizing. We, we, we need to organize as a, uh, the society, so that we can be this um, 19. The, if we can leave it in the hand of the states, then it means that at the, at the end of the day, we are going to fail as a nation or um, as a world. But we, we need to come together as civic societies, organizations. We need to come together with the states. We need to come together with other movement with um, the members of the communities so that we organize ourselves and yeah. come out, out of um, this pandemic that is uh, affecting them. Okay, thank you very much. Chepo, I hope he did not disappear for good, but thank you for reminding us <laughs> that we should not leave this all to the state. I think that's an important message in the end. Lydia? Um, thanks. I'll, I'll just say, say briefly that I think that COVID-19 is a, is a big disruptor um, and it's terrifying because it has the potential to and has already caused great um, suffering and death on the planet. And we have to guard against um, opportunists who may want to profiteer from this disaster. That is, of course, one response to this crisis, but uh, another possible, and I'm hopeful, will be the response will be that we will start to see that the way that we are running the world and the way that we are running our health systems is irrational, um, that we, we dismantle the old ways of thinking around what's private and public and yours and mine and my country, your country, and that, you know, through being forced to, to pause and, and really look at what we're doing, we'll have a global solidarity kind of response to this, which will build a new kind of society. Good. Thanks, Lydia. Um, I, I think this doesn't let left much for me to say. What I can say is, oh, thanks. Back, back to Chepo. No, uh, thank you very much, all of you, for being our guests here in this uh, in this uh, conversation, and to all the the, the listeners. Uh, the participants, which are still 63 from over 100 in the beginning. So quite a number of people made it up to the end. We will make this whole conversation available on YouTube also. So we will uh, have documented it. And so if anybody wants to share it with colleagues who couldn't join it tonight, this would be another option. Uh, we are happy to provide the link and you will find it on the website of Medico International. So thanks again for Lydia Cancross from the People's Health Movement South Africa, for Chepo Matoko from the 
Gauteng Community Healthcare Forum and Tendai Mafume from Section 27 uh, for joining us. And thank you very much for my colleague Riyad Otman who guided us through all the uh, questions from the participants and audience. Thank you very much. And I wish you all a good evening and stay safe. And uh, we are overcoming together this another crisis. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Have a good evening. Hi. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. So, I'm going to close this call, huh? I think. Go ahead. <laughs>